Well, I'm Timo Hoenig. Uh, I'm going to talk about our work on proactive energy aware programming with PEAK. And this is joint work with uh, colleagues from FAU in Erlangen, Nuremberg, and the Technical University in Braunschweig. So as a motivation, let's have a look at two mobile systems. Um, the one on the left was actually the first mobile computing system available on market. It's an Osborne one. I think it was sold in eight, 1980, 1981. And the advertisement at that time was it's the first mobile system which fits under the front seat of your airplane. Um, today, systems look somewhat similar. And it has changed a lot. And with regards to energy consumption, we are looking at one thing. The Osborne one, for example, didn't have any, any energy saving features. So we are pretty much of only with the power knob, you can either turn it on or off. You didn't have any power proportionality. And today, it's a different story. You have quite a few different ways to save energy. So you have different sleep states, different ways to um, use the CPU uh, at a lower speed in order to decrease the power footprint. So uh, what makes this difficult for a programmer is that you actually have to pick the right set of energy saving features for a given application running with a given input. So this is what we are trying to tackle with our framework. So when we look at today how people are actually optimizing the program code for energy efficiency, they usually run through three tasks recurrently various times. So first, they write or modify program code. They translate it to binary code and run it on a target platform, hardware platform. And for that, they use to be able to compare it to a different version. They use defined input data or use case, for example. And during that run, they have to perform an energy analysis of that application running. And for that, you either use hardware measures, for example, a hardware, hardware energy measurement device or energy profiler running in software. And that, of course, is a very long task, which is very uh, difficult to uh, accomplish because you are missing a tooling infrastructure which in somehow integrates the, sim uh, the single step into one workflow. And that's actually what we want to have. So we actually want to have those tasks put into a single task, and for that we require integrated tooling support, for example, into your IDEs, so that the developers have uh, tooling support right at the time of programming. We look also into the direction that we want to run the energy measurements automatically, so you don't want to set up um, a hardware setup for measuring your target hardware platform each and every time when, we, when you're trying to analyze your code. And last but not least, it's, um, it would be nice to give programmers some sort of a suggestion or a hint how they actually can um, improve their program code to decrease the energy footprint of their application. Um, so those are the three challenges we are uh, tackling with our framework. Um, we implemented a systems approach, which is um, consisting of two main components. One is running uh, it's the software, which is running uh, on different machines. And the other uh, contribution, or the second part of our work, is a hardware measurement device, um, which is uh, easily to be used for developers. And in our evaluation, we show that we could speed up the task of the energy profiling analysis steps by a factor of 8.4. And at the same time, we could show that by using energy optimization hints, programmers were able or could uh, decrease the energy footprint of an application automatically by 25%. So um, for the rest of my talk, I will quickly talk through the design and the system architecture of our, of our uh, proactive uh, energy aware programming kit. I will then talk a little bit about the implementation of it and then go into detail how we have implemented uh, energy optimization hints and how the electronic measurement device is actually working. At the end of my talk, I will give you some uh, evaluation results from our work, and I will outline future work. So uh, our framework basically is grouped into three main components, a front end, middle end, and a back end. And the first thing, the front end, is actually the implementation at the programmer side, at the development infrastructure. And it provides the user interface. For example, we have implemented two different ones, one as a command line interface, and another one as a implemented plugin for the Eclipse IDE. 
And this is the main system, uh, the main part of the system which controls the rest of the energy analyzers. At the middle end, uh, we use a passive complement for storing the actual source code we are working on. So the source code and the build data from the developer get stored in a middle end uh, component. And this is shared with existing infrastructure. So we don't provide that. It's just already there at the developer's um, tool chain. So um, once uh, we look at the back end, um, at that point, we do actually provide two different, different ways of running the energy analysis. We either apply a hardware measurement or a software measurement. So we are able to reuse existing work like energy profilings as well as existing energy measurement devices. And one important thing is that all those mechanisms have to agree on one thing. They have to agree that they provide energy, uh, energy analysis results at function level. So um, the second thing we are implementing, implementing at the backend level is the energy optimization hints. Um, those are actually the suggestions we are passing through to the developer after analysis, uh, how they can improve their source code. Or it's not only the source code, it's also the build data, so the build infrastructure like a compiler flex or actually choosing the correct compiler for a given source code, uh, which can be altered in order to, ch to save energy. Um, when we look through the operations which are running through for a single analysis run, we first submit the data which should be analyzed by the backend infrastructure as a snapshot to the middle end. And this contains uh, the source code, the build data, and the energy analysis configuration. And for that, we use uh, a Git. So we have a, a mapping from a snapshot in our framework to a Git branch. So we work a lot on Git branches, which are basically our uh, backend for uh, middle end infrastructure for uh, data storage. Um, this is also very convenient if you think of having, pro for example, different algorithms implementing the same functionality. You might simply want to submit several branches containing different snapshots of your source code and then just tell the backend to analyze all of them and we then can tell you what of the implementations have been the most energy efficient one. So this is what we do with the batch operation at that level. Um, we then advise, when we have submitted the data to the middle end, we then advise using XML RPC through to the back end infrastructure that we actually want to start the energy analysis. And this is an asynchronous operation because it might take a long time because we actually have to execute the, the program code at the back end level. Um, so for the first operation and the back end level, the energy analysis, we uh, then pull the data from the middle end that may be on the same machine, but in case, for example, you don't have the exact energy measurement device at your workstation, you might just connect the back end and run it on a, on a lab computer where you just simply have a, RP, a network in between and the RPC between the front end and the back end allows that operation to be carried out on a different system. Um, the back end then prepares the energy analysis and as I've said before, it's either a direct or indirect measurement, the direct one is the hardware management and the indirect one is when you're using an energy profiler. So let, let's have a quick look at what is the exact difference. So if we use a hardware measurement device for actually carrying out the energy measurements on the back end level, we use existing infrastructure like oscilloscope, a multimeter or ADC to do the energy analysis and then we set up the whole um, the, uh, the running environment for the evaluation and uh, we, we execute the uh, application and run the analysis in parallel. For the indirect energy measurements, it's um, just the same, but you are setting up a software environment only and run a software energy profiler in order to execute the energy analysis. At the optimization level, the second part of our um, uh, of our backend infrastructure, we um, have a short look at what we actually can do in order to uh, optimize source code or applications for low energy demand. So first of all, it's all, it, the most important thing is actually to exploit the available hardware features um, implemented on the target platform. So this is very important there to actually find the optimal set. And then it's also up to the software to actually apply changes. For example, 
uh, restructure the source code, modify timers to be aligned to each other, or to use simply different algorithms which are able to exploit specific functional features of the target hardware platform at an optimum. So in order to actually generate the optimizations, we are then uh, afterwards passing to the developer, we actually change the original source code in order to have this uh, application to run with different energy saving features, for example, at different power modes. And we push the modified source code back to the middle end and run a second um, a new energy analysis for that uh, optimization candidate. And once this has been carried out, we um, create optimization candidates which are potentially also being reported to the, to the developer. Um, so we simply look at the energy measurement results, what of the modified snapshots come up with the actually lower energy footprint than the original one. Um, we afterwards then push the, the, the remaining data back to the Git, so the candidates are being provided to the middle end. And that at this um, stage, we do not yet create the original, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the actual um, energy optimization hints, but those hints are then implemented by the front end, but they use the, the base data which we provide with the optimization candidates. So as a fi uh, fifth and final step in our workflow, um, we have the front end pull the energy analysis results from the middle end and provide it to the developer. And at that stage, we also generate the energy optimization hints. So for example, if we were able to extract or generate and extract a new snapshot, which is more energy efficient than or the original source code, including its build infrastructure, we generate a, a source code patch, which we then provide to the developer. At that point, it's very important to emphasize that such a change should not just be taken without review by a developer, because changing the program code in some way might also affect functional features of the program code. So, for example, if we are looking at real-time systems, it might be that the newly generated source code is probably more energy efficient, but it probably doesn't meet a specific deadline, deadline anymore. So this is why this, um, the final step must be acknowledged and uh, be uh, accepted by the developer. So it should not be go, going into a, a production system without review. Um, what you actually can do to, uh, to um, optimize that step is simply using use cases from the very first step. So in order, uh, in, in the case that you are able to come up with use cases verifying such functional um, characteristics of your, use, of your source code, you simply run them on the newly generated uh, code we provide through our framework. So um, this basically completes the software stack of Peak. Um, this is our proposal on how to optimize the current state of energy aware programming. Uh, but in addition, in addition to the software stack, we also have implemented a lightweight, fully automatic energy measurement device. Um, and I'll give a quick motivation why we have chosen to actually implement a new energy measurement device for our approach. So, if we let, look at today's best practice, um, if we look at the um, hardware measurements uh, available to developers, they either use the oscilloscope, a multimeter, or uh, ADC to actually measure the voltage drop uh, across a shunt resistor. So the voltage cross across a shunt resistor is, uh, uh, can be uh, calculated to the energy demand or the power demand of the of the device under test. So this is the, the best practice currently carried out by when doing electronic me uh, energy measurements. However, all of those devices have their pros and cons. What they all have to, uh, uh, in common is uh, most of the time they don't have any usable control interfaces, so it's difficult to integrate them into a system context. Um, they usually need to be calibrated and you need quite a bit of a learning to actually get used to them and how to use them. And um, the most 
important thing which actually made us implement a, a new energy measurement device is that uh, sampling which all those uh, are doing is prone to uh, lead to actual errors in your energy measurements. And this is shown by the next slide. So uh, this slide shows uh, energy or actually a power measurement of a Cortex M4 microcontroller carried out by three chained ADCs and they together reach a sampling rate of 7.2 mega samples a second. So this is already a pretty good uh, sampling rate for energy measurement. But still we can see that in between the sampling points over here in blue and on the right hand side in blue, again, um, we can see that uh, we have quite some change in the actual current consumed by the, by the microcontroller over the time. And this simply is missing in the energy measurement results afterwards. So this is really a problem. And uh, for this reason, we have been looking for a better approach for that. And we have uh, found that in a, energy, uh, in, a, in a circuit, which is exploiting the concept of a current mirror. I'll give a quick look into the main part of the, of the schematics. Of course, that's only the core of it. The, the final device is way more complex, but it nicely shows how we, how we actually work around the sampling issue. So what we have here is um, the three transistors at the top, they do a mirroring of the current drawn by the device under test, and it's being mirrored twice into the current ID1 and uh, IM1, sorry, and IM2. And now during the measurement, we have the situation that the current IM1 and IM2, they are alternatingly charging and discharging those two capacitors. And this is controlled by this flip-flop. And at the output of this flip-flop, we gain a square wave signal, which is much, much slower, depending on the size of the capacitors, of course, which is much more slower and easily to be tracked without any, any sampling constraints. So we use the result of those toggling events to eventually calculate the energy which has been drawn over the runtime of our measurement. So the first prototypes, they were quite an adventure. So this is one of the first actually working prototypes. And we spent some more months on it. And the final device looks like that. So it's a fully featured USB powered measurement device, which you can simply use with your computer. Um, it comes with a Cortex-M4 microcontroller and the, com uh, uh, and the corresponding software to actually control everything. And it does implement the fully automated energies, energy measurements which we were after. Some technical data, uh, it has an energy measurement resolution, resolution of 0.1 microjoule and gives us a temporal resolution of 6 nanoseconds. That device currently uh, in our group uh, in, in the, uh, in, in, is currently used in our group and other groups in Germany, but we will actually open source the schematics so that other groups can also um, use the device and also cha change the device in, in, in case they want to actually implement new features. Um, for the last section of my talk, I will give you some uh, evaluation results of, uh, of Peak. So we've carried out four different evaluations, and I will only talk about the first two. So those are um, energy measurements carried out with PEAK, and uh, the second one is uh, the uh, presentation of the optimization using energy optimization hints. So the first one, for the first uh, evaluation, we ran uh, different benchmark modules and compared the runtime and the actually energy demand, because most of the time people argue that uh, optimizing for performance is also optimizing for energy. And we can show that this is untrue. This is not true for all cases. So this is what we show with the first um, uh, evaluation result. The second one is um, we can nicely show that how important it is to pick the right compiler for your application. Uh, where we compare the impact on the actual uh, energy footprint when choosing either GCC or Clang as a compiler. And for the energy optimization hints, we show how we, have, uh, how we uh, could actually achieve a lower energy footprint by applying an energy footprint, uh, exploiting different power states of, of the target platform. 
This is a nice picture which shows um, how complicated small devices can get. So this is ARM Cortex M0 Plus microcontroller which we are using. Um, it shows you uh, that already the smallest available 30-bit microcontrollers already have 11 different power modes. So in this case, we have two different run modes and uh, nine, uh, nine different uh, sleep modes. And um, choosing the right set of them is giving you eventually the right set of the power saving features you are after. Um, and this is also something which gives you an idea how complicated it gets if you scale up the hardware complexity to, to create demand. So um, in the first evaluation, um, as outlined, we ran different benchmark modules in different power modes. At the top of the graph, you see the energy consumption of the benchmark modules, and on the bottom, you see the runtime. And um, we ran the different benchmark modules, they are more on the paper, in two different power modes, at low power mode, which is blue, and in normal power mode, which is red. And for almost all, but not all, um, benchmark modules, we see similar results as in the first column. So the CNT benchmark uh, clearly runs faster when you execute it in a, in, a, in a normal power mode compared to the low power mode. It's roughly about factor X, uh, 10. Um, and at the same time, it reduces the, the energy footprint. It doesn't do so by the same amount, but still it goes down by 40%. So this is, this is what we probably would expect. However, for two different other um, evaluation uh, results for benchmarks insertion sort and recursion, we can see that although the, the runtime reduces by the factor of 10, during that shorter runtime, we actually have a higher energy footprint, a higher energy uh, consumption. And this is where it's getting interesting. This is where, uh, where optimizing for, for performance does no longer make it more energy efficient in general. So in case you have an application running some analysis which is not bound to a strict deadline, you are pretty good by just running it at a low power mode which probably takes long, but you don't care because uh, you probably don't have a strict deadline. And then you make sure that you are actually consuming less energy than running the same platform at a normal power mode. So this is the, the interesting takeaway from that um, result. Um, the next result, uh, look at the compiler impact. Um, and we, um, again, have uh, used the different benchmark modules and compiled them with different versions of, G, uh, with the latest versions of GCC and Clang. And for most of the time, it's either the one compiler which is a little bit better or the other. So regularly we are around at the 23% versus 20% of the second module. But the thing is, like five of the modules have been better off using GCC and the other five have been better off using Clang. That's, that's giving you an idea, no matter what you're doing, you're, you're most likely um, off, uh, you're, you're doing good by actually looking at the numbers after using your compiler. So it's just difficult. We might be able to um, use our results and trace that back to the actual changes, optimization methods of those two compilers used. But still, as of today, you, you are better off actually checking what compiler was the most energy efficient one for your code. And one last interesting result on that slide, the cover benchmark uh, shows an, uh, a great advantage uh, for Clang over GCC because it reduced the runtime by like, um, by 80% uh, and at the same time the, uh, the energy footprint also was reduced by a large amount. We actually analyzed that um, specific result because we were unsure how this could be and we tracked it down, down to be uh, due to interprocedural optimizations which currently are specific to Clang and not have been implemented with GCC, at least for our platform. Um, for the third um, evaluation results I'm going to present today, um, we take a look at our energy optimization hints. Uh, so we had an application which is split between two tasks. So one was sampling um, the data of a triple axis accelerometer, and a second task actually did computation on that data, namely an AES uh, 
encryption and afterwards was sending out this data using a, a wireless radio. And uh, the first revision, which shows that uh, the revision provided by the, by the developer, uh, was using the low power mode for both tasks, and we then uh, used our backend to automatically switch those power modes available on the platform for the different tasks in order to see how this has an impact on the energy demand of the overall application. And we could extract one optimization, this is revision number three, which actually improves the energy demand by 25% simply by running the first task in a normal power mode uh, and the second task in a low power mode. So uh, this um, completes my talk for today. Uh, let me uh, conclude that um, uh, what I've presented, it's uh, proactive energy aware programming uh, with PEAK. Uh, it's a joint software and hardware framework to support developers at the task of energy aware programming. And it seamlessly integrates into existing development environments. And uh, we could also show that generating automatically optimization hints can decrease the energy demand of program code. Um, if you are interested in our work, please have a look at our homepage. We will also provide the schematics uh, during the next weeks of our energy measurement device at that place. And I'm now looking forward to take your questions. Hi. Um, Nyla from Georgia Tech. I had one question where you showed how energy and performance may not be uh, yep. correlated, right? Yep. And you showed that there was a pretty significant uh, difference, right, if you were just running it in low power mode. Did you have any intuition or insight as to why that was happening with that application? Like, what uh, was that, the, this one? The power modes. And oh, that the, one? Yeah, that one. Um, no, no, where you showed the low power mode and the normal. Yeah, this one. Yeah. This one. So we're um, in the case of like insert sort and yeah. recursion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, we, 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 we don't have the actual, actual reason for it. We would really have to, to look at what, what, how is the binary code uh, running on the microcontroller in order to uh, get an idea what's so yeah. bad. But then again, it might be that it's such a low CMOS level, we don't have any insight to. So we probably would have to t talk to the manufacturer whether they can explain why this is. Uh, well, I was more asking about, did you have insight of what the program is doing that it's uh, running for yeah. a long time, but still using, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that's, this is what I meant with, um, it would be interesting actually to extract um, information f uh, to come up with uh, idea what of the structure has caused that, yeah. because that would mean in, in the future would, we wouldn't even need our framework, because then you are having an idea what kind of structure is causing such a bad behavior, yeah. and then you could probably even come with the optimization and without even carrying out energy measurement. Yeah, but, but I think having yeah. such kind of a energy measurement framework is very important to even get to that, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's okay. inevitable, especially if you look at um, how complex even the smallest hardware is yeah. getting. We're, not, we're getting nowhere with using software energy models anymore because it's just too complex. Yeah, I, just, I was just curious if you had yeah. looked at why that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question about the, uh, <coughs> sorry, the uh, application of your technology, which uh, sounds very cool. If we go check the picture you have from the uh, front end, uh, middle end, and uh, and the uh, back end, so like just get uh, some feeling. Do you do you have tried this application in the uh, in the cloud scenario that uh, your front end actually is the um, the tier one stuff, mm. and the so-called yeah. back end yeah. is how do you control yeah. the all um, yeah. power consumption yeah. functions inside yeah. of the yeah. core? Uh, very good question. So actually, this is especially important when we look at um, when we run the energy analysis not with the hardware platform but with the software profiler. Um, it may take ages. So we we actually do exp there are numbers in the paper. We actually do exploit parallelism at that level to carry out very uh, uh, like large batches of uh, of energy analysis at once, and. We have applied Cloud9, for example, for running symbolic execution to generate input data for our measurements, also in a cloud context. So this is what we are looking after, yes. Yeah. 
Um, so great work. I really like the holistic approach. Uh, right. Thank you. So uh, as you said, the, dis the, the search space for what is optimal is really huge. Uh, and you can consider many things like, for example, instead of just the compiler, you can, com yeah. you can consider compiler flags. Yeah. And then you can maybe put scheduling in the mix or all of these configurations yeah. uh, for the processors and you can do it uh, as you run the program and change it. So, so, so uh, the, the search space is really, really huge. Yeah. I was wondering if you have any thoughts of any additional support you can build on top of that to help the user kind of navigate the sure, search space, sure. something, I don't know, like machine learning or what would that look like? Yes, so what you're talking about is multi-criteria optimization, essentially. I mean, you have some energy sleep state, uh, power safe mode, and you probably have some other measures like also memory footprint or some, something you want probably you don't want to sacrifice one for the other. And also, like, having five different power-saving features, how to find the right set. Um, so, uh, currently, we, we don't have anything which, on top of that, probably gives, uh, gives you control at the developer side. But we, we look at different ways of exploring that at the back-end side with the optimization hints. So, uh, Future work will most likely address that we also look at more complex scenarios. Also, what you've said, like the scheduling decisions might have a big impact. Currently, we are single-threaded on our small platform, but we right now have taken that already one step further, which is work in progress, that we are running a Linux kernel on our somewhat, uh, it's not large, but larger platform. It's a Cortex-M3. Um, which is already giving us, an, or will give us an idea how we probably also can extract such information during the analysis and then feedback that to the operating system kernel or the user. Thank you. You said you're making measurements at a, a function level. Yep. H how do you synchronize that with your, your measuring apparatus? Yeah. yeah, so what we are doing is, um, we get the information about what functions the, the developer is interested in, and we then simply pull GPIOs during the execution at the end and the beginning of the, of, the, of the function, and this takes a single CPU cycle, so this is no overhead at all. At all. So there's very little overhead. Do you have a sense about the, uh, the, the energy impact of that? Of that I mean, it's one cycle. We could actually put that into numbers, but I was it's wondering about ne the neglectable if you compare one cycle to, I don't know, like one million cycle for a short function. I was wondering about the energy impact of signaling the GPIOs, if you had gotten... Oh, we could measure that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it will be platform specific, but I assume it to be very, very low, because it's just writing a one to register, so it's not much more. For multiple yeah. ones. So you're yeah. saying one way you benefit from the batching is by the fact that, for example, you generate inputs for all of them, or that's what I understood. The uh, issue was yeah. if I have two snapshots that are very similar in a mm -hmm. sense of the program, yeah. do you take advantage of the fact that you know the pieces uh, that are common probably you have the same energy uh, expenditure? So Yes, so for the first part, we actually, in this work, we had previously work which does that. We exploit that for, for the energy profiling in software. With Peak, we actually do not generate any input. So we actually get source code and the input parameters from the developers to work with. Oh, I see. So, so we what are, is the benefit of batching? The batching simply allows the developer to, to reason about like 10 different versions in one step. So that's the benefit. In former times, she would have been required to go, th go through all those 10 different snapshots in a, in a, a sequential order, taking like days to analyze. 
And now we can simply get that batch operation transferred to the backend, and in the best case, we can even do it in parallel. So 